her name's Brenda Lang, and I just want to tell you a few things about her because I want to brag on her because nobody wants to brag on themselves, so I'll do all the bragging. First of all, she's written this incredible book. I read it long, a long time ago uh, when my, my friend gave it to me. That's how I was introduced to Brenda. It's called African Adventures, Reality in the Bush. I'll let her tell her own uh, testimony, but I want to tell you, this book, you can't put it down. You start reading it, it's literally, you can't, they could make a movie of this book. It is awesome. I recommend that you get one before you leave today. They're $10, and they help get the word out of the ministry that God has placed her in. Also, in the uh, back of the room, there are these uh, DVDs that she's, they're free of charge as long as they're available back there. And there's also these um, uh, refrigerator magnets. If you're, uh, until they're run out, you're welcome, one per family. I have one on my refrigerator. And it's a constant reminder for me to pray for her and the ministry that she has. Her ministry is called Orphans Unlimited. It's a prayer reminder. reminder. It has all of her contact information on it. If you want more information about Brenda, you can take her Vision 2013 uh, pamphlet that's back there as well. I just want to say that, because I don't want to take up too much of her time, and believe me, you can go as long as the Holy Spirit tells you, because we don't care. Anybody has to leave early? Bye. <laughs> anyway, I'm um, that hungry. I see you should be hungry for more of this. But anyway, um, amen. Amen. amen? Amen. Yeah. Hallelujah. I want to tell you, she is... Uh, to me, she's Indiana Jones or Joan of Arc, one or the other. But I don't like Joan of Arc because I don't like the ending on that story. But yeah, <laughs> th this woman is an example of what God can do through one person, man or woman, who completely surrenders everything to God. It is an amazing story. So I'll let her take up now. Did I say enough? You said enough. Did I embarrass you? No. Okay, everybody get uh, <laughs> Brenda, and they call her Bush Bunny Brenda. <laughs> Bush Bunny Brenda, give her a big, warm thank you. Thank you. Which way are you going? Do what? Oh. Okay, if you want to know why I'm dressed in my pajamas, I actually dress for the occasion. She's uh, got an African outfit on that she bought in South Africa. I bought mine when I was on a mission trip in Uganda in 1990. And uh, I've never had very many opportunities to wear my Ugandan dress that was made. I bought it right off the street in a village that had no toilets, if you can imagine. And uh, it, wouldn't, it looked like an old west town with dirt streets and, and, and the shops had uh, like a covered porches and the ladies were outside with their sewing machines making these dresses on. and uh, and I, I bought one and so I really took the advantage of this opportunity to wear my African Ugandan dress so that's that's why I'm looking like I do and it's really one size fits all anybody want to borrow it they're free to okay <laughs> anyway that's it Okay, now? You're now we're on. All right. Well, let me explain a little bit <laughs> more. I got the name Bush Bunny Brenda because I was walking down the trail one day with my donkey, which was my only transportation in 1991. Um, and I was, the donkey was right here beside me, and we're walking down this narrow trail. And it was during the war of Mozambique, they had a 32-year civil war. And suddenly this huge, I mean, over 20-pound bush rabbit Drunk, jumps out in front of us. It scared us so bad that the donkey jumped one way, I went the other, and the kids that were following me, my orphans, they said, Mama Brenda can jump higher than the rabbit. <laughs> so, so that's how I became Bush Bunny Brenda. The, story, the whole story is in the book. But it's a pleasure to be here today, and I do want to uh, tell you that it's not, okay, God takes anyone who's willing and obedient to lay it all down. And I never thought I would do this. This is not what I dreamed of my life being. But I'm going to tell you the story of how he, he called me into this. But first I'm going to tell you that what he's done in the last 22 years. That's how many years I've been in Africa. Last year we were able to save the lives of 4,015 orphans and widows because of our donors generosity so that we could buy corn and beans for them 
So you're going to hear all kinds of stories this morning. We're going to have a DVD in a few minutes. It's going to go up there. But I'm going to tell you something. The Lord told me, he says, you will go where no one else wants to go. That means you're not going to be in the city, folks. You're going to be deep in the bush. I'm a country girl from Texas. And I was a horse rancher, so we're going to now go into that story. But when I was 12, I accepted the Lord. But when I was 14, he told me he had something very special for me to do. But he didn't say what it was. So I go on through high school, following the Lord very closely. But when I got to Texas A&M University, where I went to be a veterinarian, that was my plans for my life. Yeah, you laugh. But uh, his plans are not our plans. I can guarantee you that. I uh, ended up backsliding from the Lord. And I also got interested in emergency human medicine instead of vet medicine. I made one B in my first semester, knocking me out of going to vet school. So in my junior year, I switched over and went into human medicine. I became an RN. I got both degrees, my agriculture degree and my registered nursing degree. So God was training me up to do something that I had no idea of what I was headed into. I get out of college. I'm still backslidden. And I go to work in San Antonio, Texas uh, as an intensive care specialist starting out in adult intensive care and then later going into pediatric and neonatal intensive care. All right, I'm still backslidden. I get a job in Gonzales, Texas as head nurse of an intensive care unit. I move out there, I buy the, the ranch of my dreams. 18 acres, I had the great-great-grandson of the Black Stallion, the one they made the movie from, standing at stud. And I was training him for 100 mile endurance racing. I had already done rodeo, uh, hunter jumper, horse shows. I was tired of all that. I wanted to do something more challenging. This is where you ride 100 miles in one day on, ho on one horse. You don't change horses. OK, so I called out a horseshoer because uh, I had to get my, my horses shot. But let me just back up one second. I had cried out to the Lord before this because during this time that I had my ranch, I found out that I had everything material I ever wanted. But I felt so empty inside. There was a huge void in my life, and I didn't know what was going on. You have to understand I was living in sin. I was living with someone I wasn't married to. But I didn't understand that what I was doing was wrong, even though I was a born-again Christian. So I asked the Lord, I said, what is wrong with me? Why do I feel so empty inside? Those were my exact words. But he said nothing. So I called this horseshoer. He happens to be a, a, a born-again, spirit-filled Christian and his wife, and they had moved from Colorado at God's orders all the way down to Gonzales, Texas, and started over in life. Because he knew the only people I would listen to were horse people. So the horseshoer comes out, he shoes the horse, he, they see the situation I'm living in, and they start witnessing to me, and they said, you know, you need to get your life right with Christ. And they showed me 1 Corinthians 6, 9, that says, these ten sins shall not inherit the kingdom of God. So if you want to know what they are, you have to look it up. First one on the list, though, is sexual immorality. I saw that, and I just went ballistic. I was furious. I got so mad that after he finished shoeing the horse, I threw him off the property. And I told him, I said, you can come back and shoot my horses, but leave your wife at home, because she was a real hothead for Jesus. And she was determined to get me born, you know, get me right with God that day. You know? But you know what? After they left, I had enough sense to ask the Lord. I said, you know, if I'm wrong, show me. And over the next nine months, my entire life fell apart completely. And I rededicated my life at the end of that nine months back to the Lord in my own living room. I asked forgiveness of my sins. My living lover was gone. There was no more any of, any of that, and I was at rock bottom. So I called up Dee, the horseshoer's wife, and I said, okay, what I, I told her what I had done. She was screaming hallelujah so loud over the phone. You couldn't hear anything else. And so I said, okay, I need to know something. I said, I can only go to church every other weekend because I work every other weekend. But I said, where do you go to church? And so they said, we carpool 60 miles to the nearest spirit-filled church. And so that's over in New Braunfels, Texas. So I said, okay, I'd like to go with you the next time I'm free. So the very next week, uh, two weeks later, I'm, uh, I'm heading that direction with them, and I'm sitting in a chair just like you are right there. And I was listening to the first missionary I'd ever heard speak, and she was talking about smuggling Bibles into China. And at the end of her talk, she says, if you feel called to missions, you are welcome. 
when she said that, my spirit man goes, Doo! inside of me, and I go, what was that? You know, because I feel like I'd just gone over a roller coaster, you know, and I lost my stomach. That's what was the feeling I had. I did not know your spirit man could move inside of you. I was totally a baby Christian. Suddenly, Dee passes a note down to me, and it says, I just had a vision of you training as a missionary and using your medical skills as well. And I looked at that, and I went, oh, no. <laughs> Why me? Because that's the first thing that pops in your head. Why me? Why do I have to give up everything material I've worked so hard to get and go somewhere for God? So on the way home, I'm still in shock. We were carpooling, and I said, okay, if God was calling you to be a missionary, where would you go? Because I knew you had to get some training. I didn't even know what a missionary did. And they were talking about schools, and I, they said, Oral Roberts University, and they train medical missionaries. And I, it was like a light bulb went on, ding! And I thought, okay, I'll call them tomorrow, and we'll see what it takes to get into their school. So I get home. Well, no, actually, I get back to my pickup truck, and then I'm driving home, and that's when the fun begins. Because now I'm by myself. It's just me and God. And I said, do you mind telling me why I have to go? Now, I'm a very practical person, and I love bullet point answers. And he said, I'm going to use your nursing, your agriculture, and your ability to rough it. And, you know, at that time, I didn't think a whole lot about that because I'd been camping in, in a tent, you know. I said, okay. And uh, he doesn't mean you're going to take your RV down to the state park and plug it in either. So, anyway... I get home, and I sit down at my kitchen table, and I'm listening to John Michael Talbot sing Isaiah 61. The Spirit of the Lord is upon you. The Spirit of the Lord has anointed you. Father, I give my life to you. Now, that Father, I give my life to you was the exact words I had said to him in that very room two weeks prior. Also, I had reminded him when I rededicated my life to the Lord, I said, you know, when I was 14, you told me, that um, you had something very special for me to do. I am so happy you saved me from hell that I will go anywhere and do anything you asked me to do. I was raised up in the cowboy code. You guys can laugh. But that code means you keep your word no matter what. Amen. So he knew that when I said that, I meant it. So I'm sitting there hemming a pair of blue jeans at my kitchen table, and suddenly this music is sounding very personal. All of a sudden, over my right shoulder comes a man's voice, and he says, I want the afternoon with you. I jumped up and looked around. I said, now who said that? Because there was nobody in the house but me. Nearest neighbor's half a mile away. I began to shake. I went through the whole house, checked the doors, checked the windows. There's, there's nobody here. I come back to the table, and I'm, I'm going, I'm losing it. I'm starting to hear voices, and I'm losing it, you know? And so I sit back down at the table. My hands were shaking so bad I couldn't even pick up the needle and continue working when he repeats himself, but more gently this time. And he said, I want the afternoon with you. I looked up, and I said, okay, Jesus, it's got to be you. There's nobody else here. I said, I understand you want me to be a missionary, do you mind telling me where I'm going? And voo! The whole room was filled with a golden wheat field ready to harvest, surrounded by mature oak trees. And at the bottom, it was just a big, bold black letters, and it said, Africa. Not a country, just Africa. Well, I'd always loved the documentaries on Africa, and I thought, okay, I can handle that. I'll go. Then the real fun began. Because now he had my attention, and he no longer needed to speak to me in an audible voice. I could hear him inside my spirit man. And you know what? He said, he said uh, first of all, I would ask him a question, and he would just download. It was like instant computer download. Woof! The whole answer would just be there, just like that. Then I would, got so comfortable talking to him that I would just think a question, and he just, woof! He wouldn't even wait for me to voice it. He just dumped the answer in.